good morning to you from wherever you're tuned into our mid-morning breakfast show here at Farmers Media. I hope you had a lovely night and a very good morning. Um, what are you up to? What are you doing? Um, me, I'm just here in the studio, um, just uh, checking out uh, what I'm supposed to eat for lunch. And today we want to have a very interesting discussion about our food systems and um, uh, our food systems, our changing food systems and um, the adaptation uh, of our food systems amidst the ongoing threats of climate change. Uh, yesterday we had a very interesting show with a very young lady who actually challenged me uh, in so many ways. Like, what was I doing when I was seven? Probably playing Kati. I don't know how many people know Kati <laughs> <laughs> or Kasuku. There's a, that game where you usually toss a ball and then you, you arrange like tiny, tiny um, pieces of uh, plastic. So that, that was probably what was going on in my mind. Like I, I had a lot of games uh, to play. There was Hopscotch, there was Hide and Seek. I never thought of one day uh, that I'd meet a young girl at seven years who is um, actually collecting water to give it to the wild animals. That is um, one huge um, show that I live to remember. I'm still challenged. And uh, I have another lady in studio to challenge <laughs> me probably today. Because <laughs> this week, we is, is, it's like a week of many challenges. <laughs> Hi, Fiona. How are you? Hi, Jackie. Thank you for inviting me. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to be here. And I watched the show yesterday. I was really inspired because like you've just said, what were we doing at seven years? Mm. For me, I, I, I didn't even want responsibilities. <laughs> like this is a young girl who is trying to take care of wild animals. Mm. Uh, she's taking some water, filling the holes. I mean, at that age, you just want to play, eat, repeat. Mm. You know, you don't, you fear even responsibilities. Like, you, you don't even, even in your mind, you don't have mm. that idea of being responsible. You must Simple. be told to do something. Yeah, it's, mm. uh, and you know, it comes with some sort of force. Mm. You either do this or you get a beating. Yeah. So for, for a young girl to take it upon herself to do it, mm. ah, bravo, I enjoyed the show yesterday. Yeah. yeah. She challenged me. <laughs> I, there's one, I asked her your final message and she was like, Mm -hmm. take care of the animals like wow don't kill the animals take care of the animals wow because um when uh, the dad also mentioned a, a thing about right now kitengele is becoming a metropolitan kind of kind of city the way nairobi is usually <laughs> busy and people are moving far away from um, the to urban the areas and are coming here and mm -hmm. you know most part of kajado county is um uh, ho is a home to wild animals so with foreign tribes, the Maasai's have been used to living with the wild animals. Yes. But now these other tribes coming in, mm -hmm. they don't know the importance of the wild animals. So you find that probably they're killing some of them. Yeah, they're killing because I can imagine if um, by the time you're moving these sides, mm -hmm. you're either come you're either coming to settle, mm -hmm. you've uh, built a home. So the only thing you always uh, think is about the peace and quiet. Yeah. So you can imagine if a, a, an animal approaching, mm -hmm. as human <laughs> instinct is, to fight it or to yeah. chase it away. Mm -hmm. So, and they're just animals. Probably mm -hmm. they're also looking for some water, yeah. for some food, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine if, as a human being, if you go the whole day without water, you can't. You can't. Mm -hmm. So same applies to these animals. Mm -hmm. If you go the whole day without drinking water, mm -hmm. and probably this animal is not coming to your homestead to attack. Mm -hmm. It's coming just to look for some water yeah. for relief, mm. you know. So whatever Nema is doing, ah, it's a good thing. Thank we you. are both challenged. We are both challenged <laughs> and as parents, uh, I'm challenging other parents out there. You need to encourage your kids, your children to take up such kinds of projects. Like there yes. are so many things that uh, these mm -hmm. young children can do. And uh, I think it's part of CBC. Mm. Mm. Yeah, they're being taught so many things. Mm -hmm. And just the other day, parents were really complaining they can't keep up. Mm -hmm. Like you've said, it's important for parents to try and even educate their kids about wild animals. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, they can be a danger, mm -hmm. but there's so much you can do. There's a positive side to it. Yeah. There's so much you can do to help in, in a time that the country is facing extreme drought. Mm -hmm. So there's so much you can do as a parent. Teach your kids, teach them some 
humanity. Let them be empaths. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so today we are, we are having an interesting topic. That, that was just a, a, recap a recap of yesterday's <laughs> show and how we were challenged. And mm-hmm. I, actually, it was an eye opener for me. And I think I'm going to get my kids to be doing some of these things. Like, don't just sit there and start drawing and what they play. There are some so many projects that you can do, and even from them as project, other kids can pick up from it and. You never know. The country mm. will be growing in some way. Yeah. Once you build wa- water plants in Kajiado, another com- community mm-hmm. will probably be in Kisumu, in Kakamega. How many water plants will be having? We'll be yeah. having so many. And when the rain comes, mm-hmm. uh, our neighbor here was saying that it is going to rain next week. He has already seen Just predictions. <laughs> like you can look at the clouds and you're like, hey, I have a feeling the way the clouds are looking, mm-hmm. probably it will rain uh, tomorrow. It is going to rain this evening. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the sun is too hot. <laughs> So, predictions too. Uh, they're so mm. funny. So mm-hmm. today we want to talk about uh, climate change. As you know, uh, COP27 is uh, soon approaching and um, uh, all people are talking about climate change and the effects of climate and uh, how um, climate change has affected uh, the agriculture sector and uh, what farmers need to do to adapt to the changing climate. Um, uh, CEO Noah had an interview with the World Food Prize laureate um cynthia rosenway and um this lady what won the award because of uh she has come up with a project mm-hmm. where they can uh, draw plants and clear it on a machine on a computer really you need to watch that interview it's very interesting i, I need to it's i need to get a glimpse of what they were talking um, about i was trying to get to have noah come on this show so that he can talk about uh, that interview but and it's she's not alone. She, there are many scientists mm. across the world who mm-hmm. are trying to create adaptation measures and ways of how farmers can adapt. Like even the crops you grow, you can the, you mm-hmm. can grow that crop in a way it lands in the soil and um, mm-hmm. it adapts to, to the climate. They're doing it through machines, the computers. Wow. It's a very interesting uh, discussion. But then you know um, our food systems are changing. Uh, because um, let's let's face it, GMOs mm-hmm. are here with us. They're here to stay. Uh, the broiler <laughs> chickens, we've mm-hmm. been eating them. Mm-hmm. But if you if you compare the taste of a broiler chicken and the taste of a kienyeji chicken, mm-hmm. there's quite a difference. Totally different. There is mm-hmm. a huge difference. Mm-hmm. Like you find the for me, the kienyeji chicken is the kienyeji chicken is more tasty mm-hmm. compared to broiler. Sometimes you can you cannot eat uh, a broiler chicken like twice in a week. Mm-hmm. You'll get bored. Mm. But you know kienyeji chicken you can eat it even thrice a week mm. because there are just different ways of preparing it and it comes out tasty. Mm. And I think for different communities they have different ways of preparing their chicken. Mm-hmm. And you realize it's more nutritious actually mm-hmm. eating a, a kienyeji chicken than a broiler chicken. Mm-hmm. I don't know. And the test Kwanza the test is usually Top notch. <laughs> if you ask me, me, I like broiler chicken. Really? I, I usually find kineji chicken is too tough. And then uh, the smell is just too much. Like even after mm. you've eaten, you it, feel just, it, it just remains in your hands. I think I think the way you prepare it, first of all, you've talked about it being tough. Mm. There's a way, because if I know I'm preparing kineji chicken today, I'll start preparations in the morning. Okay. Even if it's going to be for lunch, <laughs> maybe. I'll in the house. <laughs> so, uh, for me, I will start like uh, I will slaughter my chicken early in the morning, mm. and then uh, even just taking off the feathers. There's a way because from what you've you've told me, you've reminded me of my mom. Mm. My mom, if you prepare chicken for her and she feels or she smells that smell you're talking about, mm. she will not eat. Mm-hmm. Like it doesn't matter how you prepared it. For her, even if she notices a bit of some feathers, she will yeah. not eat it. Mm-hmm. So from her, I learned how to prepare the chicken. Like, mm-hmm. you make sure you remove all the feathers, mm-hmm. and then you boil it. Like, ata to a pressure cooker. Like, mm-hmm. boil it for some time. Mm-hmm. I swear the meat will be falling off the nini, the bones. Really? Yeah. I'll try that. I'll try that. <laughs> I'll try that. Mm-hmm. And this is the discussion you want to have about uh, the food. Uh, things are changing. Um, the Kienyeji Mbogas that uh, we used to eat, Managu, Saga, the Kisi community and the Luyas mm-hmm. and the Luos, you know, this, the indigenous ones, they need the taste they have compared to the taste that the ones uh, that are being sold nowadays. Mm-hmm. It's totally different. Like yeah. even the, the Managus that are sold today in the market, you can just cut them like Skumawiki. 
But yeah. in the in digital world, you used mm-hmm. to just pluck the leaves mm-hmm. and then boil them for I don't know, like gizeri. Yeah, for some <laughs> time. But this one, you just cook. Uh, you just ten minutes. Ten it's minutes like you're minutes. cooking spinach. <laughs> <laughs> so you can tell me uh, mm-hmm. what is happening to our tastes and uh, how should people start adapting? Because mm-hmm. climate change is here. It's here, and yeah. uh, the good thing about these indigenous vegetables, mm. they are sometimes they just grow as wild plants. Mm. So for communities that are struggling with hunger, or for even in the past, our grandmothers, our 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 grandfathers in the past, they used to go to the forest and they will pluck them as wild fruits, mm. and they will just come and prepare them, and they used to attach them to herbal mm. benefits. Mm. So here we are. It's um, the millennials, the Generation Z. Mm -hmm. Allow me to call them a lazy generation. You know, (laughs) we we are at a place where Jackie, someone goes to the market, there's an option of taking indigenous vegetables, Mm -hmm. but you'll be like, I want Ilenaiza to a toanisha raka. Because you want a quick fix. Mm -hmm. You want something that you can cook in 15 minutes and it's ready. Mm -hmm. And we are raising a generation that are not taught how to prepare these vegetables. Mm -hmm. So as much as you encounter them at the market, you'll be like, now how do I prepare it to have that good test, to taste even better? Mm -hmm. Because we associate indigenous vegetables with its curly, like it's bitter, it's Mm -hmm. like I'm I'm eating herbs, Mm -hmm. you know, the sagreti, the the, the suta, the managu, we always attach them to something that is bitter, even the strong smell that comes from even boiling them. Yeah. So I think it comes from a place where people need to be taught how to prepare them. Mm. Like there's a, there's a delicious way you can cook these vegetables mm. to the extent that you don't need accompaniments like meat. Mm. You know, you just mm. eat it with ugali. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You talked about the bitterness and it reminded me when I was <laughs> <laughs> that seven years. <laughs> My mom used to cook these burgers. <laughs> And you have to eat and finish. <laughs> you know what you used to do with my brother? You know the struggle. You used to make holes in the ugali. <laughs> then you put the, the vegetables, mm-hmm. make a bowl. <laughs> oh, so that you don't feel you the don't taste. Feel the yeah. Then you throw it and then, because uh, back in the village, mm-hmm. they cook the burgers and then they have the sour milk. Mm-hmm. Talk about sour. Oh. <laughs> Everything was bitter. So you, take, you make the bowl, put it in your mouth and then you, you sip the, the milk. So everything okay. goes down. Mm-hmm. And you know, that is where, imagine as a child, you you were taught to, eat, there was a very bad relationship when it comes to that mboga. Yeah. So even growing up as an adult, mm. the torture still comes back to you. Mm. You still think, hey, again, you know. Yeah. So uh, I think even the relationship we have with these indigenous vegetables mm. It's, it goes back to when we were young. Mm-hmm. I can relate. I can totally relate. Like they actually made me strong. Because me, mm-hmm. Homer, <laughs> Gini, Gini, you will not mm-hmm. find me taking anti, mm-hmm. um, antidepressants or uh, what do you call them? Antihistamines. Antihistamines. Mm-hmm. You, you can't. Like, mm-hmm. they, they, they have that herbal kind of thing. Yeah, medicinal. Me, very medicinal. And you realize even the people who consumed these vegetables could be our mothers, our grandmothers, you rarely find them being affected by mm. these common diseases, come like flu, coughing. Mm. Like for them, it's uh, it's what they used to consume mm. at the time, and even what they're consuming now. Mm. For us, like you've said, we are a group of people who, who would prefer a spinach too. Mm. You know, it's quick and easy. I go to Mama Boga, it's already chopped, it's already... Like even there are people who will tell Mama Boga, cut even the onions and tomatoes. Oh. Me, I just come and collect and... <laughs> 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 I go and the cook. And cook. Yeah, wow. so that's the generation we have. Mm-hmm. And um, since you're talking about this, I want to remind our audience and our listeners and our viewers that you can also share in your comments and thoughts on our social media platforms. Uh, we are right here on Facebook at A Farmers Media, on Twitter at Farmers underscore Media, and also on our website at A Farmers with a Z dot com. Give a comment there and we'll be sure to sample it uh, before uh, we end uh, this show. Um, remember the indigenous seed fair we, we mm-hmm. visited and the, the kinds of food we were eating? Ah, 
you're the one who <laughs> invited me. I was a bit reluctant, mm. but Jackie was like, you know, Jackie is a free spirited person. <laughs> if you didn't know, I'm telling you. So Jackie was, let's go. Kwani, what's the harm in it? Mm. So it, uh, for me, at the end of the day, I learned so much. Mm. I learned, and the experiences were, they were so good. Because I got to experience uh, food from different communities and some I had never eaten before in my life. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, it was a good experience for me. Mm -hmm. So let's share the experience with, uh, with our audience. We have some videos that uh, we gathered from that event. And um, share your thoughts on what you think about our traditional meals. Are they overrated? Are they the best? Can you even try eat those meals? Have a look and then we'll be back shortly. So this is Embo culture. This is Meru. It's nice. I would never have expected. Sure. Because I don't like porridge. But this one, yeah, but this one is this one is something else. You see the flower? No, we don't. Hey. 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 Hey.
ndine create hiyo hakuna kitu yote inaikosa kama hiyo sasa tunataka kuzomata tunachanganya na basi kama unatoka test kama hii ni yenye mifo mala lakini hiyo test ya ni njugu iko haijani hebu sifuri na tubadilishie anga hivi sifuri ni na kosa wala na kuwa na shida kidini kama <laughs> hii <laughs> na bado inakupiwa bado ni mimboga sio na kwa hiyo ikiingia kwa mwili sasa ati mtumbo mpaka hata na madeni okay okay oh mtumbo na hii to my tribes man <laughs> but uh, it looked a bit creepy <laughs> you know maybe if it was cooked so that i just eat and i'm told eh? <laughs> don't, you, don't even cook it how do you even start i think uh, this you see most of the foods there they uh, from what she was explaining mm. 
they are they are found from the wild mm -hmm. and you know it's a good way of even uh, curbing hunger mm -hmm. because you can imagine your you've not eaten anything from morning so unaenda tu kwa field unashika kapanya unakuja una dry kitu vile unasema you know it's uh, i mean it's that simple because uh, and you realize such communities people are not dying of hunger mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. like um, communities like the luya the luo the kisis there's food mm -hmm. It's because we have we've adopted to this indigenous nini foods. Yeah. So we are not dying of hunger if I mean if if we don't have food we have nini forests to go to. Yeah. We can tunaweza shika kapanya we can get the wild vegetables, vegetables you know. Yeah, yeah. So you realize it's a, it's a good way of even curbing hunger. Na sasa since mm. you are talking about hunger mm. and we are talking about <laughs> changing our taste buds. Mm -hmm. Is it about time we start adapting to this? I mean, it's about time because uh, you realize um, if, but then there's a challenge, Jackie, mm -hmm. because there are those people who are just used to eating ugali. As pokula ugali, they have not eaten. Like a typical Luya man, akikula rice amelalanja, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so how do you convince this man from adopting to foods like uh, viazi mm. cassava you know how do you how do you convince them because uh, it's it's a bit tricky it's no but tricky. you know it, it also depends on uh, usually here mm -hmm. uh, kutembea kwingi kona mengi mm -hmm. like the first video we played was uh, the not the, the second one from there the porridge mm -hmm. that made it's mm -hmm. quite delicious the, mm -hmm. that made porridge that mixed uh, was it cassava flour With they had the mixed uh, sorghum. sorghum and, and then, then they had put tamar tamarind, tamarind in. that's mkwa ukwaju mm -hmm. and a little some very little sugar and then mm -hmm. they had cooked uh, the cow peas mm -hmm. and uh, with with sorghum mm -hmm. when we ate we never felt hungry like we walked we never felt like the entire day mm -hmm. i mean how would you ever know that sorghum is cooked most of the people know sorghum is used in making beer and, and making porridge, flour and yeah. porridge but then mm. nev you never know I, me myself i never knew but when i tasted the the sorghum tastes like uh, dengu mm -hmm. what do you call dengu in english dengu green grams green grams mm -hmm. they just quite similar exactly and you yeah. can even eat it with rice with yeah. chapo and it's so filling mm. And, mm -hmm. and then you can imagine how much sorghum goes to waste like yeah. if it's not used in uh, making flour Mm -hmm. or the beer what else could it be used for yeah and you know like you've just said if you don't experience different cultures you'll never know mm -hmm. because you realize uh, there's a saying from where i come from where they say mm -hmm. if you don't travel a lot you might end up marrying your neighbor you know yeah. it's a uh, no it, <laughs> i think the the person my tribes my tribesmen will get it better mm -hmm. like you need to expand your what you know You need to travel wide and far mm. because uh, for me I had no idea that sorghum can be made with cow peas and it's a meal mm. and you can and from the embo community mm. you can just eat it like that you don't need to eat it with rice or chapati mm. so now if that is introduced to other people yeah, other communities, communities it will curb hunger because you you eat a plate of uh, sorghum and cow peas and you're full and it sustains you I, the whole day i'm actually day. sure you, you can't even finish a whole plate because you yeah. some like two 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 spoons mm -hmm. and uh, like a, like a cup of uji and i was full like you i didn't want to eat anything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you can imagine if people uh living in asal regions like here in kajado uh if they can adapt to planting cowpeas mm -hmm. even sorghum that i think i've never seen a, the sorghum crop but mm -hmm. I'm, i'm i'm thinking it's one of the crops that are uh, resilient to droughts because here yes, we even cowpeas and it's still in the farm it's still uh and you realize uh, there's a day we shared about uh, drought resistant crops and sorghum and cowpeas was among us the mm. the crops mm. so like you've just said uh, instead of people dying of hunger in kajiado we can adopt to planting such planting crops planting such crops yeah mm -hmm. and and uh, the goodness with sorghum is you, once you remove the grains you can still cut the 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 grass from uh, the sorghum and give it as hay to the animals yeah to the animals mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i did a research here and um as the impact of climate change on agricultural systems become more extensive there's a lot of research emerging on climate change and the response of agricultural systems at the micro and medium micro scales 
It's important to note that climate change is a common challenge facing all humankind that includes uh, human beings and animals. To address climate change, we need to talk uh, to take both mitigation and adaptation to consideration. The agricultural system is human controlled and strongly interfered with by human beings, and it is also the primary recipient and victim of global climate change. Many studies have shown that global warming has been uh, has both adverse and beneficial effects on agricultural systems, bringing both opportunities and challenges. Thus, a variety of tools, such as micro-household surveys, are needed to capture data to help develop policies to reduce climate risk and enhance climate resilience. That's why today we want to look at the impact of climate change on agricultural systems and the responses of different actors within agricultural systems to climate change. And in uh, Noah's interview with uh, Cynthia, she had talked about the actually the crops that uh, we are talking about that people can grow. But then um, even as uh, we, are, we are trying to encourage communities to adapt to this um, whole effects of uh, climate change, what should uh, what do you think people need to do because <laughs> we might be talking here but they're not aware that actually if your cows are dying or if your sheep are dying there's something that you can do so like mm -hmm. how can we uh, have all these stakeholders have the uh, members of the public uh, the government come together for us to uh, have a discussion on the effects of climate change because some people even in kajado we are talking mm -hmm. about climate change, but them to them on a job to join me work. Hello, join me work. Yeah, yeah. Hey, join me work. Mm -hmm. But then, what needs to be done? What more needs to be done for people to be aware that this thing is here with us, and these are the things that we need to do? I think first things first is uh, educating. Mm -hmm. If we, if there's a way we can educate the public about what climate change is, like you've just said, most people assume uh, in a season ya jua, jua imewaka sana, and some people even go as far as assuming if it's been a very hot day, chances are it will rain in the evening. Mm -hmm. So I think the best way is to start by educating people about climate change, mm -hmm. what is climate change, the effects of climate change, mm -hmm. What are some of the things they can do to mitigate climate change? So from there, uh, because uh, when you educate me about something, I'll become aware. Yeah. And by becoming aware, I'll teach generations and generations to come. Mm -hmm. Because uh, a number of people are, they don't have that in information. Mm -hmm. So that's why we are facing so many challenges, starting from even the people who are not even aware about uh, drought resistant crops. Mm -hmm. Because they're just to saying, Tutangoja wakati mvoita kuja, then we will plant. Mm. You don't realize you can plant groundnuts. They can easily survive in dry areas. Mm. You can plant cowpeas. You can plant sorghum. So it starts by educating people mm -hmm. and even educating the people you have at home. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that when someone, there are people who don't even know the difference between climate and weather, mm -hmm. for starters. Mm. So we need to have uh, mediums where people can acquire this information. Mm -hmm. And that will come in handy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But where are we failing? What are we not doing right? Like today we are having a discussion with you in the morning. Mm -hmm. You are going to buy sugar. And mm -hmm. <laughs> I, <laughs> you took I a was, step back. I, took a, I was like, uh, I'm, I'm switching from <laughs> sugar to honey. Because the prices were just ridiculous. <laughs> like I, I even asked Jackie, when, when, when was the last time I bought sugar? <laughs> <laughs> because I was, I thought uh, someone was stealing from me, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Connie, you, what usually you use in your tea? For me now, uh, the nature of my job, I don't take tea in the morning. Mm -hmm. So I'm just told, uh, hakuna sukari, and I, I'm like, go buy it. So it has never really hit me how much sugar is now. Mm -hmm. So today in the morning, I went to buy sugar myself. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked <laughs> because I even when I asked how much is one kg of sugar mm. and I was given the price, mm. I was like, uh -uh. I, <laughs> I even called you to ask how much is sugar <laughs> because I thought someone was stealing from uh, me. So you that is only sugar. That is only sugar. Have you bought unga? Have I'm you sure. Bought oil? Have you bought like <laughs> where are we headed to as a country? Because if I'm complaining, and at least I'm in a position where I can afford it. Mm. 
What about this other person who can't even afford it? You hear the prices and you you take a seat back and you're like, mtakunywa chai hivo. Mm. Ama we need to cut off on ugali. I remember I have a neighbor mm. who has uh, a helper from Western Kenya. Mm. So this neighbor is used to eating waru's and substituting so many other things to ugali. Mm. So this helper was like, if I'm working for you, mm. I need ugali. Yeah. And she was like, uh, for me, I have to eat ugali on a daily because the nature of my work, I have to taking eat. care of the home, I have to eat well. Mm. So my neighbor was complain, complaining and saying, Sasa, mm. how will I, for me, my family is used to eating these other things, yeah. uh, the waru's, the viazi. So my neighbor was like, let me start buying unga. Mm. But then she realized the price of unga is way higher. Mm. So um, as much as we are used to eating certain meals, mm. as much as we assume certain meals are making us full, mm. there's a way we can substitute to so many other things. Mm. If ugali, if you're used to eating ugali, ugali on a daily, unga saizi prices are high. Mm. So will you cut off on the ugali ama you will substitute it with something else? You'll have to substitute it or just mm-hmm. forget about the ugali. And you know, unga walisema tupeane one year. What? You can okay. imagine. <laughs> <laughs> imagine. <laughs> imagine. The grow. And the rains are not here with us. Mm-hmm. So it's uh we are not getting our unga any time. The prices are not going down anytime soon. Mm-hmm. So people just have to adjust to eating these other things. Mm-hmm. And I don't know uh for the for the cassavas for the viazis. Mm-hmm. They are also feeling Yeah, they are very nice. They are mm-hmm. very nice meals like me in the morning you really find me taking bread. I love mm-hmm. either mbwashe or nduma. Yeah, and you realize... And you get full like until 3 p.m. That's when you'll be taking lunch. You, you feel like eating something else, but eat even a half a loaf of nini, mm-hmm. bread. Uh, by Sunday, <laughs> <By Sunday, laughs> you, you're already hungry. You're still hungry. So mm-hmm. I would urge people to try and sub- substitute with these other mm-hmm. foods. Mm-hmm. Because as much as... Uh, ugali is our staple food. Mm-hmm. and uh, my But you must eat ugali from maize. You can just pound yam. Jackie, now that is a challenge because you realize there's a taste that ugali has. There's richness in ugali, you that know. Is <laughs> there's so much richness, there's so much taste in ugali. I think there's a way, like, you know, these things, they are also stemmed from our childhood. Mm. Like, what you're used to eating when you're a kid. Mm. For me, I love ugali, but now my child doesn't eat ugali. Mm. Like, she would rather eat the nguashes, the rice, the all yeah, these other things, the but she doesn't eat ugali. And sometimes my mentality thinks mm. she's not eating ugali, she will not sleep well because mm. she will not get full. Yeah. But you realize when she eats the nguashes, she mm. sleeps well and she becomes full. Mm. So it's all in our mentality and what we, we've been eating growing up. But will we be able to change people's mindsets? Like in Kisi, they love the brown ugali. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so... When you give them ugali is, this, medicine. Is, is it the same ugali that brings constipation? Like when you eat, you're told. By the way, with that, I don't, know, same, I don't know. I don't know about that. I there's know I there's don't so many myths related to that ugali. I don't know. It will give you some real constipation. <laughs> you mean? Let me take a break. We are taking a quick commercial break. I think I'm constipated. <laughs> We'll show you some more videos uh, from uh, the indigenous food fair that we had um, at uh, the National Museum in um, in uh, Nairobi. Uh, just uh, let me let me reflect on what I've had today. Eh? This one will be back shortly. <laughs> We don't want to be slaves. We need freedom. We need freedom. Our freedom 
continent issues there raised by that woman on uh, the seeds that we have and uh, the day that was the first time I saw the seeds in Beguza Maindi mm. have you ever seen uh, the seeds of maize, for maize? it was my first time too and I just realized how many varieties we have mm-hmm. I only knew of the white maize mm. white and yellow but uh, mm-hmm. the red, the purple, the red, the purple. there's another one that had uh, different colors. Yeah, it different like mixed, rainbow. different colors. Mm-hmm. For me, it was the first time, and I was just impressed. I was mm-hmm. like, even does this exist mm-hmm. in Kenya? Mm-hmm. I was surprised, but uh, it's it's interesting. Mm-hmm. It's in- interesting how we have so many different varieties, mm-hmm. and so many, f- so few people have the knowledge of it. Mm-hmm. Many people know the white and the yellow mm-hmm. maize, mm-hmm. but the yellow maize I only knew of the benefits. Mm-hmm. Have you ever eaten uh, ugali made from yellow maize? I've only eaten popcorn. How <laughs> <laughs> about that one? Is that the yellow maize? That, that's not the yellow maize. Aye. That's totally is, different. Which one is These that? Are, one? You realize popcorn seeds are very tiny compared to this type of maize. The seeds are a bit bigger. Then I probably have never seen the yellow You've maize, Basi. Me, I and knew, it was, it was being showcased yellow, yesterday. Me, I the, knew yellow, the other, yellow maize, me, I knew it in your popcorn. Not really. Mm. Popcorn, I assume it's totally different mm. from yellow maize. Mm-hmm. Because uh, that day, if you looked keenly at the yellow maize, the seeds were a bit bigger. Yeah, they just look like maize. Yeah, but just the look color like that maize. Is different. There's ugali made from it, and it's actually very nutritious compared to even the white so ugali. So how does the ugali look like? It's just, it's, a, it's not yellow, but it's a bit, it has a color. It has a color to it, but it's not too yellow. That, uh, <laughs> Do lawyers eat that kind of organic? They eat. Because they are slowly adapting it because it's uh, it's more nutritious. Like if you go to many different households, mm-hmm. you'll realize they prefer that to even the white nini, white ugali. Mm-hmm. And they, they just go to the they these places where they, they go to grind them themselves. And then you find uh, they're making ugali out of it. And it's so filling. Just a, a tiny slice will have you so full. Tell so us, it's, it, I think it's also a way of. Uh, so like, oh, you want to tell me the purple maize will bring mm-hmm. forth purple maize? I I've never tried. I might will bear white white maize. I think purple maize will bring purple maize. 
And then what will it be used for? Because even Giveri, you can't see it. <laughs> With different colors. But I think uh, even for the yellow maize, when you're going to grind it at the portion meal, mm-hmm. they should advise you to mix it a bit with the white maize. Mm-hmm. Because uh, for yellow maize, if you grind it alone, mm-hmm. even the texture, mm-hmm. it will be too soft. Mm-hmm. It, uh, it will be like, uh, we'll be making the pap, the ugali that South Africans and Nigerians make. Mm-hmm. But you know, Kenyans, we are used to the, the, hard, the hard ugali. Mm-hmm. So if you want the, if you prefer the hard ugali, they will advise you to mix it with a bit of a white maize. Mm-hmm. So the, you just go around mixing it. Mm-hmm. So I assume even for the purple maize, you might mix it with the yellow and the white. Mm-hmm. But it won't, because the white, the white will overpower the purple. Mm-hmm. So it won't come out as purple. Yeah, but I think it's a nutritious way we of need, trying. We needed, we needed to have a nutritionist uh, in this show so that, mm-hmm. or probably someone who has knowledge. Yeah, who food, can clarify and tell a few us. Because even from Ilya, the rat one, mm-hmm. the rat video, <laughs> eh, those, those things are weird. They're weird. And my question the was. Are weird because you're eating grass. And my question was uh, you realize is rat is a bit of a wild animal. That is an word. <laughs> it's is an understatement. Because uh, some of these animals, they have poisonous mm-hmm. elements in them. Mm-hmm. So do you bring, do you, do you remove the poison? How do you, where is the poison stored in the, in the animal's body? But I think for them, they, they smoke dry the animal. Mm-hmm. So by drying it for a few days, mm-hmm. the, the poison is dead. The poison dies. Ah. <laughs> I, I assume so. <laughs> because even there's a way there's a way the Luya community prepares their meat. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, you know the way people fear eating the red meat mm. for its assumed nini health effects. Yeah, yeah. So the Luya community always dries their meat. Mm. So they dry the meat for a few days as they store it in ash for mm. preservation. Mm. And then eventually they cook the meat. So they believe it's more nutritious mm. eaten that way mm. than eating it when it's uh, in, in the fresh states yeah mm. even me i don't usually buy when i buy meat i don't mm-hmm. buy like the one that has been slaughtered that day mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i like when the blood has already come out of the meat so i'll, okay. I'll buy like if i go to the butcher i'll ask them give me nyamaya juicy oh really there's meat yes yeah. mm. you you're the first person i'm hearing that from because most people usually ask in nyamaya leo because we assume nyamaya juzi mm. it's not fresh maybe it's at the verge of even smelling i don't know <laughs> no it depends on where you buy it mm-hmm. like i don't like the one that is has blood flowing on it okay so it, it, like everything has already come out all the waters the, oh, the, the it has meat, been drained blood, it has drained so mm-hmm. now the meat is in its now that's when the meat is is, is nice to be cooked I and think. then jackie let me ask you that these restaurants you go and then you order your beef steak mm-hmm. and then they ask you do you want it uh, raw mm-hmm. medium raw mm-hmm. or you want it cooked and there are people who prefer eating it medium raw like even as you're cutting through the meat there's blood dripping eh. <laughs> there's a problem there <laughs> Uh, there are people well, who prefer it. That's dangerous. It, it was actually a huge debate mm-hmm. because most people were asking, mm-hmm. even for health purposes, mm-hmm. is it a healthy way of eating meat? Am I it's just a different type of meat removed from a different part of the animal? Well, yeah, that's what I cannot <laughs> answer. <laughs> I cannot answer, but mm-hmm. all I know is uh, most people like eating the meat raw. Like really? in my village, when they slaughter, let's say, a goat or mm-hmm. a condo, you mm-hmm. find the men there, they remove the blood from the animal. They make this, this a, something they, they make. They add on to the they, blood. They add on to the blood and then they mm-hmm. drink. And then they cut out the liver and um, some of mm-hmm. some parts of the meat and they share amongst themselves, like when it is raw. And they say it's the best. I don't know. I don't know, but... For me, I cannot Personally, eat. I cannot eat raw meat. I cannot go... D- even, even if it's a matter of life and death, <laughs> <laughs> I cannot eat it. I don't know how it will... Even if there's even no the fire. Do they put some salt? Am yeah, I just consuming... they put consume? some salt. They cut the, the chilies. Mm. Like, they just eat it, it. It's like it's cooked, but it's very raw. And then mm. when you ask them, they're like, this is the best. It's very healthy and... I know. Maybe some of our audience can expound on that. Because I don't know, I, I even hear that Ethiopians eat raw meat. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how t- 
true is that? Maybe someone can just come to the comment section and expound on that and maybe even tell us how healthy mm. it is to consume the raw meat. The benefits of uh, raw meat. Hey, Jug, I am not boarding. <laughs> even, <laughs> I am not boarding. <laughs> even when you talk about eating blackjack leaves. But blackjack leaves has been out. eaten for centuries. Who, who does that? It's uh, the Luya community, especially the Teso, they consume that. And it has actually helped them the time of hunger when they're experiencing, because this is a wild plant, it just grows anywhere. Now get serious, Fiona. Mm -hmm. Is it hunger? Is it poverty? What exactly think, is it? I think me, it's now a... when, when you look at this veg these foods, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing like it's, we are going mad. It's not about going mad. These are recipes that have been passed from generation to generation. So these are people who are still holding on to their cultures tight. So you realize um, different communities, they have been eating things that have been passed from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. Maybe we are just a generation that is trying to break that mm -hmm. by consuming uh, a variety of yeah. food. Yeah. So um, if the generation before our grandfathers were consuming the same, mm -hmm. and they even attached it to medicinal value. Mm -hmm. So you realize it's so hard for these tribes to break that cycle. And they realize, they, they, they'll even tell you, this is the way to go. Mm -hmm. Because these vegetables have been treating some of the ailments, stomach mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit hard. It's not associated to poverty, mm -hmm. but it, it more, it mostly used as a medicinal value. Mm -hmm. And they attach it to curbing hunger. Because when it's dry and there's no food, there are some wild plants that will remain standing. Yeah. And for centuries, people have been consuming them. And then... Uh, the question that is lingering in my mind is if the Teso community are eating the rat and blackjacks and they're mm -hmm. surviving, mm -hmm. then why are people dying of hunger in other areas? Like, why mm -hmm. are people... Because uh, I'm assuming blackjack grows everywhere. It grows everywhere, even in drought-stricken areas. Mm -hmm. Then why are people mm -hmm. losing lives? Why are people going hungry? I think uh, it's uh, what you don't know. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there are people... Like if you go to Meru community today, you'll realize they're consuming some things that to you would be like, ah, but that is a wild plant, that is a wild fruit. Mm -hmm. Maybe your beliefs have told you if you consume these certain fruits, you will die. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you'll have issues with your stomach. So it's just certain beliefs that we still carry with us. And different communities, their communities will not consume what we consume. So I think it's a way of... Uh, extending some sort of knowledge to even these communities dying of hunger and telling them this thing that you're looking at as a wild fruit can be consumed mm -hmm. yeah so it's just fear of the unknown because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. i've had several interviews with the various experts and right now most of the organizations are actually training mm -hmm. most people uh, in the asal regions that they need to move from relief to mm -hmm. being resilient yeah. And um, this is a very interesting conversation uh, that uh, we'll also be sharing with these organizations because most people die because of lack of knowledge. Yes. Mm -hmm. And even uh, the question you've just posed like a minute ago, mm -hmm. why are people dying of hunger mm -hmm. yet some communities are consuming? These yeah. are the things. It's mm -hmm. because lack of that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's something that's it's growing outside your doorstep, but you're like, this is a wild yeah. plant for me. I cannot consume it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very true. And you can imagine the Teso are eating blackjack. And um, in uh, we were in the talk shop last week for the World Food Day. And the food wastage that is there, my friend. Mm. Tomatoes, when they're doing the grading, mm -hmm. they're just throwing. Like the ripe tomatoes, the red ones, mm -hmm. they're just being thrown away because they're like, these ones, you can't transport them. Hmm? Mm -hmm. then, no, no, then you go like, um, what, what, where are we going wrong? Like, why, is, why are we having all these things? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I get, I get what you're trying to say, Jackie, because you realize there are some places that food is being wasted. Mm -hmm. There are some regions people are dying of hunger. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't even, like, the math enough. is not mathing. Mm -hmm. Because you realize the tomatoes, the, these farmers, they are large-scale farmers. Mm -hmm. They are large-scale tomato farmers. Yeah. And for them, the quality of tomatoes matter a lot. Yes. So that's why when they're harvesting, they will grade these tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And then I, the question that I pose is, if you're going to waste mm -hmm. the tomatoes that are not of quality, mm -hmm. why can't they be transported mm -hmm. to this drought-stricken area so that people can just even have food 
or even uh, do value addition you know mm-hmm. if they are overripe you can probably make a paste mm-hmm. because they cannot be transported make mm-hmm. a paste and then they can be uh, transported to these oh, further yeah. regions you know instead of just throwing them i remember uh, mm-hmm. this, this summer was asked now what happens to these tomatoes that you're growing and he was like those are mediocre <laughs> <laughs> Wait, the tomatoes that don't that are don't get to grade one. Yeah, you so, know when they are grading, they usually take the blue band that the ones that are almost red, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then the yellow ones. Okay. So the ones that are red completely, mm-hmm. you know, when you tr- when you try to transport them, they'll yeah, they'll break, they will... and once they break, they'll spoil these other ones. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So because they don't have any place to to take them, they just they just them. dump them. They dump them and then they are eaten by goats and sheep. Hey, that's that's and, uh, sad. That is, uh, it's not the first time I'm visiting a farm where they're doing that. There's mm-hmm. another farm I visited where they were harvesting cabbages. Mm-hmm. So they usually take the big cabbages that are heavy. They have got some weight. That no, that mm-hmm. when you you see when you're you, when you're checking for the cabbage, you, you knock it to mm-hmm. see if it is fully loaded. Okay. So the ones that are not usually loaded, they usually just dump them. And you know that uh, you've talked about value addition. Mm. But you realize, Jackie, if I decide to do some of value addition on tomatoes, where will I take them? Like if my intention is to sell, everyone is almost doing that. Mm-hmm. So there's a, there's a glut in the market where everyone is doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. Back in the day, there were restaurants who would take yeah. tomato, tomato paste from, t- nini, from people who are doing value addition. Right mm-hmm. now, the restaurants are doing them themselves. Mm-hmm. So how do you convince someone that I'm going to do value addition on these tomatoes and then I'll sell them to you. Now that is a story for another day. You need to <laughs> catch up with us as we try to link you to markets. And um, we, there's a project that uh, Farmers Media is running called Transport Logistics. And uh, we'll be showing you cheap and available ways to transport your goods. Mm-hmm. Like, by the way, <coughs> in the, the meetings we've been having, we've never talked about value addition. You know, when you, mm-hmm. uh, when you do value addition, it reduces the, the the amount of luggage that you need to carry. <laughs> in terms of transporting things yeah, to the market. Yeah, in terms of transporting. But now, Jackie, let me ask you. Do you know if I go to the market today mm. and someone is selling me tomato paste mm-hmm. from what they have uh, from what they have done? Yeah. You know, I'll be so skeptical. Mm-hmm. I'll be like, is this I is this safe? Is this okay? Mm-hmm. We are so used to buying packaged products from the supermarket mm-hmm. we assume they are safe but they were made by someone still it's but i don't know is it the issue of matters. branding packaging yeah because it's so tricky for someone and in so many markets you look you'll realize people are selling value added mm-hmm. value addition mm-hmm. pro- produce yeah. and you'll be so skeptical and you'll even ask are they clean is it safe mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and even i assume the process is mm-hmm. the process is too demanding because if you no, have... what is demanding in surely in making because a Jackie, paste let me, from tomatoes? Let me... So you just remove the... Boil the tomatoes, remove mm-hmm. the skin, put them in a blender, pour the... No additives. In a... In a... In a... In a no additives. And now there, you know... For preserving... Because I can imagine, Jackie... <laughs> <laughs> I can boil my tomatoes today. Yeah. And maybe I can even, you might find myself overcooking them. Mm. You know, there's also the issue of doing too much mm. because sometimes we just need professionals to come in mm. because you might overcook it. Mm. And then even in terms of packaging, how do you know, to, how, how will you preserve them? Mm. So by the time you're getting your stuff to the market, tomato paste, it's becoming black. How will you sell it? So there's so much that goes into it. But me normally when I buy my tomatoes, I usually mm-hmm. just uh, boil them a bit. When you see the skin is, you, you, when you just do like this and the skin comes mm-hmm. out, you put them in mm-hmm. a blender and then you put it in the freezer. Mm-hmm. It doesn't change the color? It doesn't change. Hey, put it in the maybe. freezer mm-hmm. and the, you can even use the, the paste for almost a month and it doesn't go bad. Mm-hmm. But then there's another lady who was telling me you can add oil. Remember Mkorogo when you were mm-hmm. in high school? She used yeah. to make them Mkorogo. Yeah, to, to move, carry to school. To yeah. And it used to, to sustain us for a month. Yeah, she told me oil mm. helps in preserving these mm. things. But then me, <clears throat> the, the thing of, of value addition I'm talking about is mm-hmm. because we, I'm giving a scenario of, let's say, Turkana, and it's far from, like, talk, talk to Turkana. You can mm-hmm. actually do that. Uh, make the paste for, mm-hmm. for the, from the tomatoes and then put them in... in uh, mm-hmm. Jazz or midungis, mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. It will, you can imagine how many uh, buckets or uh, jerry cans you'll be able to transport, transport to, to Turkana as compared mm-hmm. to the tomatoes packed yeah. in, uh, in sacks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's, it, it can be affordable. It can be affordable. Mm-hmm. It can be affordable because um, even when you f- think about transporting the tomatoes, mm-hmm. you'll, you'll just get somewhere and throw them away. Yeah. <laughs> because that are surely the people you're taking this relief food to, mm-hmm. we they're not animals. At the end of the day, they are human beings. Yeah. So they also require decent food. It needs to be fresh mm. and uh, healthy and nutritious at, at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very interesting. And um, this discussion about hunger is uh, one of the discussions I had with Kyle Poorman. He's the director of International Dialogues at the World Food Prize. And... Um, Kyle uh, mentioned a thing about the reason why people uh, are going hungry is because of poverty. And he mm-hmm. really tried to convince me. And somehow, I was somehow convinced. Mm-hmm. He was saying the moment countries end uh, poverty, mm-hmm. like the moment na- uh, governments end poverty in their, in their countries, then people will start um, having healthy, nutritious meals and we can be able to combat food insecurity. But then, uh, when you talk about poverty, Jackie, mm-hmm. there are people who've got tons and tons of land, mm-hmm. yet they, in the same same communities, people are dying of hunger. Mm-hmm. Back in the day, land was a sign of wealth. Yeah. So is it because people are not utilizing these lands, apart from being poor? Mm-hmm. I cannot be poor and I have 10 acres of land, and I'm still dying of hunger at the same time. Mm-hmm. Is it just my negligence because... If we utilize most of our lands, mm-hmm. trust me, there will be an increase in food production. Mm-hmm. But even if you travel to f- these other towns, mm-hmm. you will realize there's so much unutilized land. Mm-hmm. So for me, I don't believe poverty is an issue. Okay, poverty could be mm-hmm. an issue, mm-hmm. but then we don't utilize our lands. Mm-hmm. Even when you move, when you buy a piece of land for retirement, when you want to settle, Try and just come up with a kitchen garden, something that because we are going to a place where there will be more drought, there will be more hunger, there will be a hike in food prices. Mm. So if we don't start growing our own food, mm. we will feel it. Mm. If even if you don't start a vertical garden on your balcony, for those people who complain about space, mm. just start a vertical garden. Yeah. Because Jackie, if we will not be able to feed ourselves, then at they will not akuta kwa na chakula. Mm. Because even you, you meet so many farmers, they're crying of akuna mvua, mm. so we are not planting anything. Yeah. The price of vegetables is going up by the day. Mm. The other day I was in the market and uh, they just sell at two leaves, the skuma is five shillings. Imagine, leaves. imagine. So how many leaves am I supposed to eat? <laughs> and for those people with families, <laughs> we, we don't even want to go that route. So what we, are, what we should encourage each other and even encourage generations to come, mm. we should start growing our own supply. Yeah. Do whatever you can mm. with what you have. Mm. Even if you have the smallest of places, yeah. just find a way of growing anything that can sustain you. Yeah. The mm. people who are even growing on walls, the food, yeah. small teams, and Imagine. they get something. They get something at the end of the day because they, there will be an increase in food prices. Mm. And where will we go from there? Yeah. Hmm? We are going, we are going, I don't even, I, 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 I don't even want to think of where we are going, because there, there is some time back, no, mm. I was just cautioning us here at a farmers, and he was like, this drought is real, and people need to start planting vegetables as early as yesterday, Yeah. because where we are heading to is um, just a worst Things case. are going to be worse. Mm. Uh, they, and you know, and the saddest part is uh, there, there were some areas where we wouldn't even expect mm. to be affected by drought. Mm. But those areas are slowly being affected. Mm-hmm. Areas like Meru, Nyeri. Yeah. Those places it used to rain on a daily. Mm. They used to have an endless supply of food. A lot of food used to come from those places. Mm-hmm. But now when they're slowly facing drought, they will only be able to sustain people in their community. Mm-hmm. What happens to most of us who are waiting for food to come from those areas. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're finished. And uh, we've talked about that. I've also remembered there's a story I saw yesterday online mm-hmm. of uh, floods in Nigeria. Have you seen Larry Mado doing an interview in, inside floods? 
Ah, not yet. That one I've not seen. Uh, the Nigeria, it's raining like crazy. And it's flooding, like people are being carried away by water. Wow. So I'm wondering where did Kenya wrong? <laughs> it's not about. I, I don't think. I don't think it's just. Uh, this is a season where we should be, we should be awake in terms of curbing this. We should now focus more on climate change. We should now focus on ways that we can mitigate climate change. This is the time. This is the time to teach people more how to plant trees. And someone will ask me, "Tutapanda mti nani atamagilia maji? Where will that water come from?" Yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah, because this most people are saying you you're encouraging me to plant trees. You've even brought the seedlings. But where will I find the water to water these to trees? Water Before these I know trees. it, they will be dying. Mm-hmm. There's nothing that we can do. And even as we gear up to COP twenty seven and the, there's a lot of discussions that we'll be having on climate change. I think it's about time that uh, countries really have serious discussions. Because there's no way one country like Kenya here we are having we are crying of drought and Nigeria is People are, flooding. It's flooding. Mm. You know the irony and I'm sure even with the with floods, you can't nini, you can't farm. Yeah. If it's food it's being carried away from farms. Mm. So we are this is the time all over the world it's one thing or the other. Mm. People are facing climate change is real. And it's it's affecting like us in Kenya, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are crying of hunger because we cannot grow food. There is because no water. Rain. But Nigeria, they also, they'll also end up in the same scenario like Kenya because yeah, they can't with, grow with food. too much water. They can't grow food. They can't, they can't sustain do anything, and anything that you plant. Mm. So we are just let us just encourage it. Do what you can as an individual. Do what you can. Plant what you can. Educate your kids about climate change. Mm educate your neighbor, educate someone who is ignorant to it, someone who is just saying it's a season, it will die with time. Because uh, if the guy we talked to this morning, mm-hmm. the guy is a farmer, yeah. but he is thinking the rains will come next <laughs> week. <laughs> he's already forecasted that the rains will come next week. So he's banking on the rains yeah. so that they can sustain whatever he's planted. Mm. So if they don't come, Mm-hmm. Disappointments. <laughs> you took a ground. Yeah. <laughs> so edu- educate yourself about climate change and yeah. different seasons, different weather patterns. And just how to adapt to now this climate. Because yeah. it's already here with us. What can you do? Like, if Nigeria is flooding, the government, the Nigerian government right now should be working on harvesting that water. Yes. Yeah. And preserving and, it. And preserving it and keeping it for the later days. That mm-hmm. is what Kenya should have done. And mm-hmm. even if we pray, if it rains uh, next week, <laughs> let's start harvesting. Like yeah, it's building harvest. water plants. Let's we build water plants and uh, harvest this water. Because mm-hmm. this water runs. You can imagine we, uh, all these rivers are dry. Because when mm-hmm. the water flows, it goes into the Indian Ocean and it is taken away to other countries. Yeah. There's a, we need to capture this water for Yeah, we need to preserve years. it for later, mm-hmm. later use. And like you've just said, we need to come up with ways in which we can adopt to this, mm. adopt to an increase in food prices, yeah. plant your own vegetables. If, you're, if you have a, a kitchen garden full of veggies, I have it. Mm. What will make that mama boga sell anything to me expensive? Expen- no. I'll be like, I don't even need it. Yeah. I have. Mm. And they will have to sell it at a throwaway price because no one is buying. Mm. So just try and come plant your own kitchen garden. Yeah, very interesting. Mm. And uh, this discussion can never end, but uh, I just want people to listen into an interview, an interesting interview I had with uh, Kyle Poorman. Uh, the the last interview, the last interview with Kyle Poorman um, on um, just the reason why people are going hungry and uh, what do nations and uh, governments need to do to combat hunger. So take a look at this interview, and we'll be back shortly. How long have they stayed this month? How old are they? Yeah, two years old. Two years? No, we will not have them. How many you treated them with something? Like, I don't like that. Yeah. 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 Jahe. Yes, that's so the, 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 the blood. 
Today we've had uh, I don't know we've been talking for <laughs> for long, but we missed long. the microphone. We missed the microphone, mm-hmm. and there's a show that will be coming be, by us, me and Fiona. I, I know some of you have seen it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the farm girls. This will be get drop, man. This will be get drop, man. <laughs> the farm girls. Let them keep. La- we should excite them. Mm-hmm. So that by t- by the time we are going live or we are putting anything out there, mm. the excitement has built up. <laughs> but I'm telling you, the people who will be coming in that show, mm-hmm. uh, the women, yeah, because it's an women all woman thing. It's an all woman thing. So mm-hmm. women out there, start following up. We really need mm-hmm. to make a page. Okay. Yeah, we need to make a page. Start uh, following us, uh, telling us uh, where you're at, what kind of farming you do, and we will be coming to your farm. With all our equipment, the the gumboots, even the yeah, we are <laughs> representing farm girls all over the world. Yes. So watch out for that. Yeah. So we've <laughs> had a good time today in the show, and I want to leave you everyone with this uh, wonderful quote uh, that says, "Let thy food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food." Amen. This quote, <laughs> the thousands of years old, acknowledges the importance of healthy eating and how the nutrients in your various foods have healing properties mm-hmm. what a way to end the show yes. we have to say goodbye sorry till next time guys till tomorrow <laughs> we'll see you uh we'll leave you with the interview from uh kyle Poman, um on the discussion we had on uh, how to end hunger in africa and um hope to see you i, I was not able to sample uh, your comments but uh i'll respond to each and every comment uh with fiona here we'll respond to all the comments and give you shout outs in uh, tomorrow's show so see you bye bye um and then this is my co-worker kyle who um is the real expert on these things so um, become an hi, African hi. Timer. <laughs> this is Jacqueline. An timer. <laughs> hi hi how are you um my name is kyle porman i'm the director of international dialogues are you in nairobi yes i'm in nairobi kenya okay all yes. right well, wonderful Lots of good friends in Nairobi. Betty Kibara from Rockefeller. Ah, good, okay. good friend. Good uh-huh. friend with, 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 with Betty. So, uh, and CD Glenn used to be there uh, as well. So mm-hmm. I don't know if you know CD, but uh, I know Betty. I know Betty. Oh, good, good, yeah. good, yeah. good, good. She's actually so I used to. Uh, she got her PhD from Colorado State University in mm-hmm. um, uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. I used to live there, so uh, so we have we have that connection. So ah, nice. Well, you speak a, a little bit of Swahili since she's your friend. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> zero <laughs> <amount>. <laughs> Interesting. Probably, yeah. I don't know if you're ready. You can start the interview. Yes, really. Um, I'll have just you. Are you recording this too? Yes, yes I'm um, recording. Yeah, so that you okay. can. Uh, I'll get out of the way, so it's not. Okay. This weird 
woman in the sky. <laughs> So probably you can start by an introduction just for the benefit of our audience to be able to know who we are having. My name is Jackie Kemuto. I'm a producer and presenter at Farmers Media, where we do stories to do with agriculture. And uh, tomorrow will be World Foods Day. So we thought of talking to you people who are working on the food systems in the, the developed countries. So probably um, tell us a bit about yourself, who you are, and um, the organizations you're working with. Sure. So my name is Kyle Poorman. I'm the Director of International Dialogues at the World Food Prize Foundation. The World Food Prize Foundation was started by Norman Borlaug um, uh, some, well, almost uh, over 30 years ago now. Um, and really that, uh, the genesis of that was because uh, Norman won the um, Nobel Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize for his work on, on dwarf wheat. Um, and he actually went to the the prize committee and said, you know, we should have a uh, a Nobel, you should have a Nobel Prize for agriculture, um, and that and and that wasn't possible, um, but was was possible to start an organization that really um, brought together people around the world to focus on agriculture. And one of our um, big pieces is we award the World Food Prize. Uh, every year this year at Cynthia Rosenzweig, uh, uh, a NASA scientist um, who who did kind of the first climate models uh, that that showed climate change impacts on agriculture. and and she's really morphed over time to bring together modelers from around the world and around the academic spectrum uh, to focus on climate change and then climate change adaptation and her group that she started as AGMIP. Um, uh, but she was one of the first 1988. She was doing the first kind of impacts of climate on agriculture in the U.S. And then in the early 90s, she did she did a global study, and that's really where she she came up on the scene. Uh, so so we're going to honor her this year. Uh, last year it was Shakuntala Tilstead um, and her work on fisheries. So we're really you know we're 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 a global organization um uh with with a mandate to give prizes but also we we tr try to inspire uh the next generation of people who are going to work in food systems and so our youth programs touch people all around the world uh in in secondary school and in university and in post university and educators uh, and so we have significant uh, uh, amounts of of youth programming uh, as well as our kind of dialogue. And so this year, Borlaug Dialogue is occurring this next week, uh, feeding a fragile world where we'll have, you know, thousands of people uh, online and, and about a thousand people in person. Very interesting. Um, I don't know, I, I, it's the first time I'm hearing about the Wild Food Prize, but we'll get into that because uh, <laughs> tomorrow will be Wild Food Day. And um, yeah. we want to talk about the World Food Day. Probably are you aware of it? And um, why is it even important to have such days commemorated? And how is America uh, commemorating this day? Yeah, so, well, I think it's important to focus um, people's attention on food and food systems. Um, and so, you know, in the United States, I would say that uh, a set of people are 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 focused on it, um, but you know, around the world, I think uh, you know more and more people are commemorating World Food Day, um, and 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 I I really think that's because this is the the essential piece of life, right? It's the essential piece of 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 where we are, and so I think it, we can, for example, uh, if we can focus people's attention. Uh, on the need for access for healthy food for all, um, and uh, that's that's true in the United States. We're not a where significant portion of people are not getting, you know, healthy food, um, and you know, around the world. So I think that's I think that's of course we should fo be focusing it on the other 364 days too, um, but it it is a day to focus the attention of the world uh, on. Um, food security, on nutrition security. Very interesting. And uh, when you started talking, you mentioned uh, something about this year theme focusing about feeding a fragile world, 
right now we are having changing uh, uh, hard times, the, the effects of climate and uh, the war in Ukraine, and most countries are just um, busy trying to end hunger. First of all, I don't know if you've heard the report of uh, Kenya lifting a ban on GMOs. What are your thoughts on GMOs? And um, UN, UNS, UN's SDG2 talks about ending hunger and achieving food security and improving nutrition and promoting sustainable agriculture. Um, if we are to feed, uh, to feed a fragile world, what can countries do? Should we go the GMO way because we are having these harsh weather conditions and um, the, the, the changing kinds of uh, seeds that we are doing? Right. So a, a phenomenal question. So uh, first of all, feeding a fragile really world is really focused on this idea that, you know, what we've learned um, with climate change, with COVID-19 and the pandemic shock, with a conflict shock um, that then create higher prices, um, that we see that food systems uh, around the world can be very fragile and events that happen outside of your country, um, whether it's in the United States or whether it's in Kenya or whether it's in Bangladesh, um, you know, outside forces can really affect, you know, the provision of healthy food. Um, and so we're going to deal, we can deal with that in the short term, for example, price shocks, they're short term shocks. And then there are long term shocks like climate shocks that we're going to have to adapt to. Um, but how I view this and how I view the GMO question is that we don't need a single silver bullet solution for everything. We need innovations across the board. And so we need literally thousands of solutions. So it's not just about GMOs, right? And on the GMO topic, I think that GMOs are a specific solution for a specific set of problems. I'll just let you know that there are, there are very few GMOs in the world, maize, uh, soybeans. Um, I think that there are, th those are great solutions in some places and may not be great solutions in other places, right? Because we don't have GMOs in, in, in vegetable crops and fruit crops, but we have other significant problems there that we need to figure out. And that those problems are like, how do we ship them? How do we keep them cool? How do we get them to market? Uh, I'll just, you know, mangoes in Kenya are a great example of, of investments and how do we get them to market? How do we get them so that uh, Kenyans can export them to the EU, which would be a big uh, boon? So we need thousands of solutions. And I think biotechnology and GMOs are one solution, but I don't want to get hung up on that, right? I mean, I think, uh, I think GMOs uh, in maize make a lot of sense in Africa because one of the the side effects is a good side effect in that it really reduces the amount of aflatoxin, right? And so if we have uh, GM maize, um, then the aflatoxin problem, which is a significant problem across the continent, really gets reduced, right? And so we have, a, you know, we can reduce aflatoxin in other ways, better storage techniques, picks bags, but those are kind of small scale solutions. Um, if we have GM maize there, it can reduce um, uh, the aflatoxin, which you know causes liver cancer and other cancers. So, so I think that that's. I don't want to get hung up on that though, because there's so many other crops out there that are not GM crops, that are not you know biotechnology crops. I think there's a, a market for that, but really we're going to have to make innovations in a lot of other places. Mm -hmm. Right now, the theme for this year is feeding a fragile uh, world where most people are going hungry. In your opinion, what would you say are some of the reasons why people, are, uh, especially in underdeveloped countries, go hungry? Yet, majority of them are farmers. Yes. So, so I would say yes. So I think the reason why people go hungry is is really not about the food supply chain itself, but it's oftentimes about poverty. Right. And so poverty reduction strategies across the world in developed and not and and developing countries, I think, are essential to food provision. Right. And so we we call those strategies nutrition sensitive strategies. And so I think that that's where we can we can really hone in um, in the United States, for example, um, we've learned a lot uh, uh, about um, how we can provide uh, assistance, 
quickly during the pandemic, which was in the form of cash assistance. Um, and what we saw there was the fact that when we provided a, a basic amount of money to people, um, we actually saw people spending that on 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 food across the, the spectrum. Uh, and so we need to have nutrition sensitive policies in each of our country. And yes, farmers are, are typically the ones who bear the brunt of not only the climate shocks, but the ability to feed their families. And they should be able to feed their families. Um, and so we need we need programs in place that allow them to make a, a good wage uh, or a good amount of money for the, the, the items that they produce. And oftentimes that's not the case now. Very interesting. Now, what might be some of the differences between a family farmer in the US and being a family farmer in a, an under, under, underdeveloped country? And what do you think is the common? Uh, is, why do you think, what do you think these farmers have in common? Well, I mean, I'd say that the things that they have in common are that they are, you know, they're, they're stewards of the land, right? Mm -hmm. Stewards of the land and stewards basically of all of us, right? Because all the people who rely upon their food for survival, I think that's common amongst them, you know, a, a soybean or maize producer in Iowa <clears throat> or a you know, a maize producer in Tanzania, right? I mean, that's, I mean, they're very common. Uh, I would say that what's different is oftentimes in the United States that we have much fewer family farmers now um, or in in developed countries in general, but the, the amount of farmers is completely decreased. There's a much more higher reliance on um, technology and the size of operations are quite different. Um, and so, you know, those, those, those things are, are, are vastly different, but I don't think that the, the people themselves are, are that different. They, they have a, they typically have a calling, um, uh, that they are, you know, and, and that their, their lives are, you know, they, they, they work with their hands. They're, I mean, there's, they're kind of salt of the earth folks. And I think that that's, that's common amongst farmers, no matter if they have a, a, a tractor and a combine and, you know, um, 500 hectares, or if they have, you know, a plot of land that's uh, an eighth of a hectare and they uh, um, uh, have to make do with that. I think that's, I think that's, that's common. I think also that they're probably the most hardworking folks. Um, uh, and, and typically across the spectrum, whether you're a farmer in the United States or a farmer, other places, they're not super well paid. Right, um, and so that I think that's that's a, maybe a common theme as well. Going uh, by the changing times, what uh, is your take on the, the food systems and um, the world being able to end hunger according to the UN's SDGs? Um, are you seeing um, a change in the in the food systems, how people eat, and where are we at? Where where are you looking? Uh, where are you gauging? We'll be at in the next like five to ten years. Well, I would say that in my state of Iowa, right where we're where we're coming to you from right now, um, we have significant levels of hunger, uh, and really? we have significant yes, we have we have significant levels of of hunger. In fact, we have we have um, um, people who are using a, emergency food aid. At, at, record levels mm -hmm. um but that being said is that we also have the ability if we make it a priority to end hunger um in the state of iowa and across the united states and probably across the developed world um and so the the priorities uh are are a significant issue right so if you if we prioritized ending hunger i think that it it would be doable. I don't know if it's doable in the in the 2030 aspirational time frame, but I think it's I think it's um, um, doable. But it's it's about about prioritizing poverty alleviation and reduction. It's it's not it's not so much about prioritizing. Um, we can get much more efficient in food systems and food provisions across the world. And there's a lot to say about 
you know, how we move food, um, you know, COVID-19, especially in, in developing countries, uh, when kind of informal transit networks broke down uh, or, or were basically stopped in countries and between countries, uh, we saw that people really had a hard time because a, a lot of food was moving through an informal network, um, which I think is is something that we we came to realize how important those types of informal networks were for provisions of food uh, in developing countries, and then how um, kind of shock you know if there's a you know if commerce or if trade stops, um, how quickly food becomes a a, um, a big issue. Mm -hmm. um, but in, de in developing countries too, it's about poverty allevi alleviation, not mm -hmm. just, you know, um, so people can afford uh, healthy, nutritious food. Mm -hmm. Talking about nutrition, what probably would you encourage families to do probably because you're talking about poverty and uh, some people may not be able to afford three days in a meal. Um, what is your take on uh, the affordability of nutritious meals and how can people probably substitute to get yeah. a, a, a nutritious meal? Well, I, you know, I have to say that we, we face a, a nutrition problem in, in a lot of different places and it changes mm -hmm. uh, based, upon, based upon where you are. Mm -hmm. um, nutritious foods have to be available and they can't just be luxury foods right um, um, but for example in develop in developed worlds uh, people have significant levels of, of food related diseases for example in Iowa there's about 40 percent of people who have non-communicable food related diseases 40 percent right that's almost a hundred percent preventable um, and that's gets directly to how people eat mm -hmm. um, and so I think that this is a, a significant issue. Um, but if, if, you know, fruits and vegetables um, are much more expensive, uh, it is very difficult um, to eat a healthy diet, right? It is, very, it is very difficult. And so that the cost of those things are a barrier to entry a lot of places, especially if, you know, um, lower cost, faster foods are available in, in the economy. Uh, and some of those, you so, you know, some countries across the world are very good at getting low cost, high sugar, um, um, high processed foods uh, into markets because of course they have high, large shelf lives, so they're cheaper. Um, and so we do need to focus on this uh, nutrition piece. But I'd also say that, you know, people, should be given the opportunity to to eat what they like, right? Uh, and so we need to we we need to have education about eating. We need to have a wide variety of things available for people, um, uh, and definitely do not follow the kind of the United States model of 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 eating because we now see that that is a huge, um, you know, it's a huge cost in healthcare. It's a huge burden for people's lives, right? And so there's there's a different way other than you know heavily processed, heavily sugared food. Yeah, because the reason I ask that is right now the ongoing uh, uh, conflicts and um, it's uh, a bit it's tough times for most people, and you find that people are just eating for the sake of getting full, <coughs> and uh, yeah. not just because they have to eat a nutritious meal. Um, and it's it's interesting uh, when you mention all these things. And I was talking with Emily and she was taking me through the dialogue that is coming up next week, where yeah. most of the experts will be talking about how to deal with the certain conflicts and um, different uh, scenarios that come about. You have the COVID-19, the climatic conditions. Um, probably take us through a little bit about the dialogue and uh, what should people expect? Yeah, so this, I mean, really, the dialogue we bring people from around the world we focus them on on different different topics and really what we're we're really interested in learning and uh, rejuvenating from shocks right so that's what we're really interested in um and so a lot of our our panels are our our discussions are about 
you know, well, what did we learn? What do we what have we learned and are learning from a pandemic, um, and how that relates to uh, food provision? What must we learn about climate change? Um, because that is a that's a significant, you know, that's an ongoing thing that, you know, um, people, for example, in Kenya, right, uh, uh, um, you know, the trap where tropical fruit is produced may change, right? Where maize is produced may change. The pest that you, um, that you, you know, uh, whether it's fall army worm or whether it's other things, there, there may be a, a significant uh, um, change in the pest environment. Uh, uh, and so we we need to be, be able to think and talk across continents. Uh, for example, we're, we're, we're convening folks from, from the Americas and who have, you know, basically partnered across at the continent of Africa and, and the Americas to, to think about how we can move technologies between uh, countries. And, and in fact, you know, thinking about the Brazilian, um, you know, the Brazilian ag economy, it looks a lot like um, um, places in Africa, right? And so how do we learn across, across those areas? Maybe we don't learn from uh, maybe we don't take much from highly mechanized um, uh, soy and um, maize production in the United States because that's um, maybe not a great, but how cassava in Brazil, which is a large, um, they, they produce a, a significant amount of cassava. How do we learn about that in in the continent's perspective? And, and so we're convening people on that. Um We'll be convening ministers from uh, across the world, uh, ag ministers mostly uh, from across the world to be discussing these topics as well. Um, uh, and um, the US government is going to uh, launch a new food security strategy uh, at the dialogue. So we're we're excited about, about that. We, um, uh, the US government, in 2006, I believe, launched the Feed the Future initiative uh, at the World Food Prize, um, uh, and so this this new um, food security strategy, I think, will be uh, uh, global in scope. And so we have um, uh, Samantha Power, who's the administrator of USAID, and Tom Vilsack, who is the um, Secretary of Agriculture, uh, talking about that new strategy. And so I think that's that's going to be really interesting, and of course, we uh, value our our laureate, who is Cynthia Rosenzweig, and we have a, a Borlaug Field Award winner, which is a, a young scientist, um, uh, and he's a um, Gavundaraj is, is 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 his last name, uh, and I'll go with I'll go to Emily maybe to say his first name, but he's <laughs> he's, a, he's an Indian. Uh, he focuses on 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 millet, and actually um, biofortified millet gets back to kind of the nutrition um, the nutrition component there, right? Is that uh, also millet is a is a crop that could be um, climate uh, smart? Um, so I think that's that that could be interesting. We're also thinking about climate smart crops, right? Um, sorghum is a great example of a uh, of a climate smart crop that we produce in the United States somewhat, but on the continent, um, uh, sorghum production is is significant. And also because of its low water intake, um, uh, it could be a, a, a good, it, it could be a good maize substitute, right? Um, maize is, um, uh, has a high water, um, uh, it needs a lot of water. Um, and so, so that, that could be, that that's essential. And of course, maize is a staple crop across the continent. Um, and so how we produce maize um, uh, on the continent, I think is really important. It gets back to the GM question, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and the aflatoxin, aflo aflatoxin question about how we um, produce and store maize, which can be stored for a long time. It's, it's, a, it's an excellent, but we need to be able to store maize in significantly bigger quantities on the continent and be able to uh, move it um, much more efficiently. And that way we don't lose as much maize in the process. Um, so I think that's that, that that's really a big, fo would be a big focus of mine is how do we deal with this with a stable grain like maize 
durable crop, um, w which a significant number of farmers on the continent are producing, especially in, in Kenya. Um, and uh, yeah, so I kind of got off track there, but I but I hope you. <laughs> it's very it's an interesting discussion. I'm really looking forward to yeah. just listening into what the experts have to say. But realistically yeah. speaking, what can you tell farmers? Like, let's now start the dialogue. Um, yeah. How can farmers um, recover from a shock like climate change? Like most of the farmers who are doing horticulture farming in Kenya have stopped because they, there's literally no water. So how can farmers recover from such shocks? Yeah, so this is, I think this is the, this is the, the, the number one question, right? If, if you're, if you uh, experience a long drought, um, how can you produce horticultural crops? And I think that that's, I mean, basically, um, we oftentimes see in that case, right, the farmers then move to urban areas, mm -hmm. right, and look for work in urban areas. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that's, uh, that can be difficult. Um, I, I think that in general, we're going to see need over the long term, right, we're going to need to see more trade um, to deal with, you know, if there's a, uh, if there is a short term drought in, in Kenya, then we need to see more. Long term, like we've missed yeah. rains for two seasons now, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah. like forty years. Most of the right. people, animals are dying, and right. yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, yeah, and so, so, I'm saying that you know it is in, it's a significant, unbelievably difficult problem, and I think the only way that you can do it is 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 have strong trade connections. Um, and, uh, if, you know, I would say that, that where agriculture, where things are produced mm -hmm. will be completely changed. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there may not be, um, you know, this is awful to say, but there may not be, you know, herds in the same places. There may not be, you know, mangoes in the same places. There may not be maize in the same place. Um, and really that impacts the the least, I mean, it really impacts the people who have no money, right? Um, and so, for example, where we produce most of our vegetable crops in California, it's now been a 20 year drought, uh, mega drought, right? The longest mega drought in, I don't remember, it's like 5,000 years or 7,000 years or something like that. Uh, and so we have significant infrastructure to move water in the United States, and that's failing. Um, and so I would say that we're we're seeing this across the globe, and you know, it is. Com I there's no short term solution, yeah. is is what I would say. I don't that that's not sugarcoating it because mm -hmm. you can't. I mean, we won't be able to stop climate change even if we stop the emissions. We won't be able to stop the process for hundreds of years, right? And so it means that there's adaptation. Maybe more people are, you know, maybe there's a higher urban population, um, which is, tr I mean, typical, right? It's typical. It's not, um, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't have any really comfort uh, in that sense, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Very interesting. We cannot end this discussion without talking and mentioning this the topic on food wastage and uh, food storage. What is your thoughts on food, and why does why do we waste food? Why do we waste food? Well, <laughs> actually, you don't you know, I, I've seen I've seen data from the continent, and typically, there's at the consumer level, there's very little food waste, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that I think that like uh, developed countries have a, an immense amount to learn from from consumers in places like Kenya, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's 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 very very little food waste in Kenya. Mm -hmm. What in terms of post-harvest loss, mm -hmm. that's where we could really make a difference. Uh post-harvest loss really, I mean, you know, if you're losing 50% of your vegetable crops, mm -hmm. which isn't abnormal, right? That's not abnormal um, because it's very hard to store and ship vegetable and fruit crops. Uh, or if you're losing, you know, 20% of your maize or um uh, durable grains, um or, or beans, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
that's that those are things that we can we techno technologically wise we have good solutions for and so we have good solutions for them um but we need to create markets in which you know people can um get services so that they can have cold storage that is reliable right there, there needs to be places that farmers trust to store their grain in bulk um uh and and you know, farmers also need access to credit so they can buy technologies, right? And so I think I think there's a whole bunch of of, of issues that we could actually solve in terms of post harvest loss. That's probably the the low hanging fruit um, is is the post harvest loss one. But there's a I mean, in the developed world, food waste at the consumer or right before the consumer uh, is significant, um, and we need to be able to address that. Um, and, and I think, you know, countries like the Netherlands, uh, are addressing food waste, um, in, in the, in a developed world context, places like the United States is, are way behind in food waste. So I would, um, I, I, I would say that, that it's a focus, um, but it's, you know, um, uh, it, it, it's something that, that we need to work on significantly. Mm -hmm. so. So as we end, uh, probably, what is your message for everyone who is listening to you today on the World Food Day? What can you tell them? Should they eat healthy? You, what is your message? Well, you know what? I think that, um, you know, eating a, a healthy diet that's that has vegetables and fruits in them um, and, and has a uh, you know, would be really great for for people across the across the world. But um, I think in general, you know, we need to think about food and its place in our lives, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and think about food, you know, in a way that that we say like, you know, I'm my brother's keeper, I'm my sister's keeper, and the fact that we we understand that people who are, you know um experiencing drought or floods uh or famine um the impacts on them affect us how we consume affects other people what we produce affects other people and we also need to create a world that's really interconnected and so that we can you know if there's a flood drought famine um uh trade can move between whether it's you know, between Kenya and Tanzania, between Kenya and France, or between Kenya and the United States or Japan, um, that 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 food uh, uh, can move in in those places to make up, uh, so that we're all in this together, and it's not you know, uh, <clears throat> no Uganda against Rwanda, you know, or. And, and so forth. It, it's got to be like we're we're all in this together. We, we produce food, we ship it around the world, and we're our you know we're we're the protectors of each other. That's what I'd say. Yeah, it should be our brothers keepers. Like we, we shouldn't see like one country is doing good and you, the other country is starving. If you have this kind of food, you can share with this other country, and there's the interstate connection that takes place. That's very interesting, and it's quite a mm -hmm. very interesting message that you've shared. Uh, we cannot end by you not mentioning the World Food Prize that is coming up next week. You already have a winner. Uh, for the benefit of our audience who don't know what the World Food Prize is, probably mention and if they want to take part in the next one, even if they want to take part in the next one. <laughs> what should sure, you, so, how, should, how do you go about it? So for, first of all, um, you know, worldfoodprize.org. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's free for anyone who is... Uh, um, living in developing economies or the global south, um, so you can still register now uh, for the for the virtual event. I just wanted to, I wanted to say that so you can see all all of the um, uh, this this week um, basically the what is the eighteenth to the twentieth, um, uh, and you know for Kenya there's going to be a it, it there's going to be a great window from about you know um three or four in the afternoon and then it will go um but it will be recorded so um uh so you can you can watch it at any time but just just noting that 
that it, it will be based upon U.S. time, so that that kind of afternoon times, time afternoon evening is when we'll be live. Um, the World Food Prize um, started in 1987 when we gave the first World Food Prize, which was to Emma Swaminathan, um, and uh, a, a contemporary of of Norman Borlaug. Um, this year we are awarding it to Cynthia Rosenzweig. Uh, it's a two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollar prize, um, and we give it to we give it to the winner, and they can do whatever they want with it. Typically, they though they they um, you know for example the the president of the African Development Bank and he set up a youth program uh, uh, with his winnings. Um, so typically, people do uh, give back with that prize, but it's it's a it's a prize, right? They can people can do with it, and we really we recognize people um, for their body of work. Um, and Cynthia is is so deserving uh, of of this prize, and she's actually bringing people together with AgMIP, and now AgMIP uh, is helping uh, about twenty countries um, around the world on climate adaptation plans uh, in on the continent. I believe it's um, at least Senegal. The, the, there are others as well, but I, I, I know for sure that the government of Senegal is working with with, with AGMIP uh, uh, on a climate, climate adaptation plan. And so really using commu computer modeling uh, to understand the impacts, but also understand, you know, uh, the economic impacts, um, what types of crops can be planted. And so I think, you know, Cynthia uh, really deserves the prize uh, as a as a capstone for her career, but also, you know, she's going to do great things in the future as well. Mm -hmm. Very nice. I'm looking forward. I'm, uh, I'll, I'll join for next year, not not this year, though. So. Okay. <laughs> I, well, I, we, in the well, mind. Yeah, we'll have you in. De we'll have you here in Des Moines, uh, Des Moines, Iowa, uh, the heart of the the kind of the farm. I'd call us the farm capital of the of the United States here in in Iowa. So we're we're in in harvest time right now, and so so we're we're harvesting um, mostly maize and soybeans. Um, uh, it's a sight to see. <laughs> it's a sight to see. So we're, right. we'll look for you next year. Um, <laughs> but but for everyone who's, you can still watch online this year. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, and, and Jacqueline, I'll just send you the details for that and um, some additional information about Cynthia and um, the winner of the Borlaug Field Award, Mahalangam Govindaraj. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, I emailed Ellen, so, and I'll talk with her to make sure we can try to um, arrange a, a conversation with Cynthia as well. Uh, nice, I really, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Kyle, for making time. We've had a very lovely discussion. But before I let you go, I need you to do for me a drop. Just say, hi, everyone. My name is Kyle. And you're watching a farmer's media. You say your name is Kyle from where and which organization? And you're watching okay. a farmer's media. A farmer's media? Yes. Hi, my name is Kyle Poorman from the World Food Prize Foundation. I'm coming to you from Des Moines, Iowa, in the United States, and you're watching a farmer's media. I cannot do it with no vibe, and uh, <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> you're too serious. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm a serious guy, you know. <laughs> um, uh, hi, I'm Kyle Poorman uh, from the World Food Prize Foundation, coming to you from Des Moines, Iowa, in the United States, and you're watching a farmer's media. Yay. Thank you so much, Kyle. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to more conversations, not just because we're having the World Food uh, Day and Food Pride. We'll be looking for you to just have this discussion and keep the dialogue going. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jacqueline. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.